Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about bleeding chunks of Wagner. Now, I knew we would have to tackle Wagner at some point in our lives, and because everybody has to, you, you can't avoid him. It's like, you know, trying to drive around a traffic jam, you know, you just get stuck and you have to deal with it. And so we have to deal with Wagner. Ideally, we should talk about complete operas, and someday, maybe I will. I would like to do that, except that I find some of them atrociously boring, and, you know, to have to listen to five-hour chunks of them all over again just to summarize how I feel about them is a project that I probably would never live to accomplish. But, but you know, I had my Wagner period. I really did. We all go through it. I understand. It's normal. It's also normal to get over it. When you don't get over it, something is wrong. I'm telling you right now, if you're not over your Wagner phase, you need help. I'm over it. That means I can sit back and enjoy the parts I like and not feel guilty about the parts that I don't. I have to say, though, one of the things that most intrigued me about Wagner was that the opera that I found dullest on record, which was Tristan and Isolde, I actually find works wonderfully on stage. And that's kind of fascinating because nothing happens in Tristan and Isolde. They basically stand around and sing at each other, you know. I mean, there's there's one, you know, the one, one episode in Act Two where you have the Liebesnacht, you know, where they just they just sit there and lieb. That's all they do, and and it's night, and and you know, it, it really is. It really is sort of astonishing, but that's the way it is, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, King Mark shows up and he lectures them for like forty minutes. It seems like you know about how disappointed he is, and then what's his name? That guy Merlot, you know, Merlot shows up and they he fights with Tristan. And, and and Merlot wounds him. And then in act three, he rants and raves and rants and raves and rants and raves and rants and raves and rants and raves and, and, and dies. And then Isolde does the Liebes taught, which you don't even recognize with Isolde in it because it's so much better without her, right? You know, so the bottom line is, I mean, now I like Tristan and Isolde, having seen it and knowing what's going on, I can sort of understand it and put it in my mind when I listen to it. And now it makes sense, such as it is. But the, the point is that that Wagner's music works wonderfully well on disc with no voices or few of them. And the bleeding chunks that everybody decries because, oh, they're bleeding chunks, they're excerpts, you have to listen to complete scenes, you have to listen to this whole conception. Bull, 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 bull. You don't, they're fine. The only one that's stupid is the forest murmurs because it just, tweets and cheeps and bleeps and repeats itself endlessly and it's 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 it is stupid i mean let's face it but everything else is terrific including the ride of the valkyries which made a great film score you know accompaniment to you know dropping napalm on innocent villagers in, in apocalypse now it, it it was fabulous for that purpose and so i have no problem recommending as many bleeding chunks and bits and snippets as you as you could ever want listen to them completely without shame without guilt you don't have to waste four or five hours at a time listening to complete works you know it, there's just no reason why you should have to go through that unless that's what you really want so with that in mind i'm going to talk about a whole big stack of discs that i think that have given me just tremendous pleasure in Wagner's music over the years and may well do so for you. And some of them will be real sleepers. I hope you'll be a little bit surprised. But it just goes to show, of course, that Wagner's genius was universal, however much he tried to limit it to the German ethos. And lots of people do it well. It's not that hard, actually. It's pretty foolproof, I think, as long as you don't take it too seriously and you don't play it like a philosophical treatise as opposed to actual music. So let's talk about Dick Wagner. First, we're going to do some historical things because you have to if it's if it's Wagner. You know, you have to talk about some historical recordings, but some of them are wonderful, the ones that are listenable. Toscanini! 
Toscanini was a great Wagner conductor. And these recordings on NBC, and there are others floating around, you know, I mean, you can find them everywhere. I mean, just, you know, check out, you know, your basement. There's probably some Toscanini Wagner sitting there somewhere. Um, but these are wonderful. I mean, his conducting of Wagner was so intelligent. It was so, I mean, Wagner was Toscanini's contemporary. I mean, he was. I mean, you know, Toscanini was born in the 1860s. These are, I think he was born in the 1860s. I don't know. Wagner was born in 1813. But I mean, Toscanini understood how to make that orchestra sound, how to realize all the polyphony, how to balance chords with textures. And oh my God, these are smart performances. And they are, of course, Toscanini. So they're clean and disciplined, but they're not fast. They're not hasty. They're not, they're not rigid. The, the, the closing scene from, from Gerda Dammerung, which is here somewhere, yes, uh, right? Siegfried's death and travel. Brunhilde's Schlussgesang. Yes, here it is. The immolation with, and this is what, this is the disc here, with Helen Traubel and Laritz Melchior, where you get Siegfried, Forrest murmurs, you know, okay. But you get the Dawn and Siegfried's Rhine journey with the Brunhilde Siegfried duet, um, which is absolutely ferocious, and Siegfried's death and Trauer March, the old Trauer March, which is so much fun. I have I have to tell you this. I've played I played that piece a few times, and I added a tam tam, <laughs> and it sounded better. And uh, let's see, and Brunhilde's immolation scene. I, you know, the way Toscanini conducts this is just, you gotta hear it. You've just gotta hear the orchestral parts. And this second thing here has um, Die Valkyrie, Act One, Scene Three, which has, you know, Winterstorm, da 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 you know, that business. And then you get the Ride of the Valkyries, the Siegfried Idol, which takes less than 18 minutes, which it always should, unless the conductor is an extreme genius. And the Tristan and Isolde Prelude and Liebes Taught, which takes 18 minutes in this performance. It's like, ooh, ha huh see, he wasn't always slow. Now, something about the Ride of the Valkyries and the Funeral March from Gerda Damerung. Wagner writes in these pieces for what's called a Röhrtrommel. That's a tenor drum. This is a large parade drum with snares on the bottom, although they're heavy. They're, 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 they're you know, made out of, of gut. And so when you hit them, they help the drum roll, but they don't make a snare drummy type sound. How many of you have heard the Röhrtrommel part in the Ride of the Valkyries or in Gerda Damerung, for that matter? The fact is, you almost never do. You have to listen really carefully through the texture and you'll hear this drum going <laughs> the climaxes and the loud bits. Roar trumbles are practically impossible to hear in an orchestral tutti. Their sound just, just disappears. There's also a roar trumble in the battle scene in Einheldenleben. Have you ever heard that? It doubles the snare drum most of the time, but it has some separate things. You, you never hear them. They're, they're a complete stupid waste of time. I would just leave them out. But in some of these recordings, they are so clean and clear, you could actually hear the tenor drum part in the Ride of the Valkyries and in Siegfried's funeral music. And by the way, it should be Siegfried's funeral music. I'm usually not picky about those things. Everyone calls it Siegfried's funeral march, but it isn't a march. It's not a march at all. It's funeral music. It doesn't have that rhythm that of, of normal march. And at that point in his career, Wagner was opposed to rhythm. He hated rhythm. He didn't want anything to have rhythm because rhythm was what those icky Italians did and the French and those people who he wasn't trying to sound like. And Germans have no rhythm. So Wagner wanted no rhythm. And so it's called Siegfried's Funeral Music, even though on records, you'll see it, they call it like Trauer Marsh all the time. It should be Trauer Musique. That's what it should be. I mean, here, even in French, they call it Marche Funèbre, Funeral March. But in English, they say Siegfried's Death and Funeral Music. They get it right. That's the way to look at it. Next recording. Oh, this is a great one. Oh, this is a great one. Karl Schurich with the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. 
This is hot. This is hot stuff. This is in the, the box, the Shurik box, the DECA Complete Shurik. But you can get it separately if you can find it separately. This is unbelievable because it's the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. It's in mono. You've got a trumpet with a vibrato wide enough for Brunhilde and Grana to ride through. I mean, it's... Oh, fabulous. Fabulous people. Schurecht was a great Wagner conductor, and the orchestra was a... The French always played Wagner the best. I don't care what anyone says. You know, Ned Roram once wrote a fabulous, fabulous article about how Wagner was really a French composer. And of course he was. He wrote grand opera, French style, and wanted everybody to ignore it and forget about that fact. But that's what he did. And the French realize him best of all because they understand they understand the need for that, the grandeur and and the taking it vastly more seriously than it deserves to be, you know? <laughs> the French always take things more seriously than they deserve to be, including themselves. And so, you know, when to hear Schurich, I mean, a real German guy with a real French orchestra doing Wagner, ah, it's, it's stunning. And you also get uh, the prelude and lieb is taught from Tristan and Isolde and Dawn and Siegfried Rhine Journey, Journey, and Tchaikovsky's Capriccio Italia and that other Wagnerian favorite. But this is hot, hot stuff, my friends. Give it a listen. It'll shock, shock you to death. I'm sick. Guarantee it. Next, another great Wagnerian who didn't live, unfortunately, to do too much Wagner, Bruno Walter. Now, these are great for a couple of reasons. First of all, you get a 44-minute rehearsal of the Siegfried Idyll, which is just worth hearing to hear how a great conductor builds a performance. I enjoy it more than the actual performance of the Siegfried Idyll, which is a little bit more than 18 minutes, 16 seconds. So, I mean, you know, with, with you know, the opening and the end, what well, we're going to call it 18 minutes and say it's okay, basically. I like it even less. You'll see that in a minute. Then we have the prelude to Meister Singer. And on this one, we have a fabulous Flying Dutchman Overture. I mean, this is with the Columbia Symphony. Who knew? I mean, they play the crap out of it. It's terrific. And then the prelude to Act One of Lohengrin, which is Lohengrinish. I find it boring, and it's always boring, but this is a really beautiful performance of it. And two excerpts from Parsifal, the prelude, and the Good Friday music, which I also listen to and it makes no impression on me most of the time. And and then there is Tannhäuser. Now this is great. This is 25 minutes long. It's the overture and the back and out. And it's really hard to find the overture and the back and out together usually. So to hear a great performance of them combined is really is really a special thing. And Walter's performance is fabulous. So you should really give Walter's Wagner um, a shot. These are these are wonderful wonderful performances. So. That's Walter. Now we come to the sort of more modern ones. Let me see, do we have any more? Well, we always like a little bit more historical stuff in a minute, but you have to get Zell. Of course you have to get Zell. First of all, Zell did the best ring excerpt disc ever. There is none better. And I know, you know, remember they've made those, the ring without words, you know, Lauren Mazel did it on Telarc, and then they also did Tannhäuser without words, and all these Wagner operas without words, and then Edo Devart did that horrible, th this is like a three disc set of The Ring and Parsifal, and with photos, cover photos that are so politically incorrect and grotesque, especially these days with the Me Too movement that you can't even show them anymore. I have them. I wouldn't I wouldn't dream of letting you see them. That's how offensive they were. But anyway, Zell's Wagner is, you know, it's, it's you know, some of the greatest ever. And his ring excerpts are phenomenal. And these two, uh, these were these were essential classics. They also came with some, some Ormandy stuff, which was also not shabby. It was also very, very good. But uh, if you can get the Zell stuff, this is the, this is the one. It's the ring excerpts, the Meistersinger, uh, prelude and the prelude and Liebes taught from Tristan and Isolde, two minutes faster than Toscanini, 16 minutes in a bit. So there you go. And and this one has it, Tannhäuser and Lohengrin and Flying Dutchman and Rienzi and the Faust Overture, but some of this is Ormandy and I'm not going to sort it out. They're both great. Um, the Zell stuff obviously is in the Zell box. And so if you can get that, go for it. You're in great shape. Now here's one 
that I just love. I just love it. And it's it was totally unexpected. This is Klaus Tenstedt with the Berlin Philharmonic. And it's a, a, an absolutely, absolutely wonderful disc of Wagner stuff. I mean, Tenstedt was one of those inspirational conductors. You know, he canceled as much as he actually conducted. And when he didn't cancel, you never quite knew what was going to show up. You could get totally fabulous Tenstedt, or you could get, oy, 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 this isn't my day, Tenstedt. This is fabulous Tenstedt. And it's, you get uh, the Ride of the Valkyries, Dawn and Siegfried's Rhine Journey, Siegfried's Death and Trauer Marsh, Musik. And you get Das Rheingold, the entry of the gods into Valhalla, the forest murmurs, the stupid little forest murmurs, and Votan's Farewell and Magic Fire Music. It's a great ring collection. It really is. Oh, it also has the Tannhäuser Overture, which is not from the ring collection, obviously, and a wonderful performance of that, too. This is hot. This is great stuff. Never got much press when it came out, but it really deserves to. And I listen to it now with enormous pleasure, just as a wonderful memento of a great conductor who sort of, you know, after he defected from East Germany, he made a Mahler cycle and did a few things. But I don't know. I'm not sure he was ever really able to give his best, especially with the London Phil and EMI and so so sonics and I don't you know anyway next we have a bunch that all came out on testament but you can get them all in other ways too because testament was EMI and stuff is all reissued so you knew it Kempa Kempa was of course one of the all-time great Wagner conductors I mean he did a stunning ring he did he made Lohengrin sound interesting which was an Achievement, trust me, my friends, that's an achievement. His Lohengrin is one of the great ones. And here you get Lohengrin, preludes to Acts 1 and 3, the Parsifal prelude, the Good Friday music, the prelude in Liebes taught from Tristan and Isolde. And this is the kind of stuff, I mean, Kempa the colorist, again, at his absolute finest, it's, it's a knockout. It's a disc that you got to hear, whether you get it here or in one of the Kempa boxes, you know, on, on Testament or on on Icon, on EMI Warner, you have to hear Kempa play Wagner because he just had the style in his bones. But next, we come to who I think is, I mean, one of the most astonishingly great Wagner conductors and unsung Wagner conductors. You know, the one that you really ought to talk about, but people don't, Cuiton. Andre Cuiton played Wagner like it was with in inevitability and rightness and sensuality. Oh my God, that was incredible. Now there are two discs. One of them is stereo, one of them is mono. And they were both made with the, the Orchestre du Théâtre National de l'Opéra de Paris, the Paris Opéra, the orchestra that premiered Wagner in Paris and probably still, you know, knew how to play it back in those days. This was in the late 50s um, when these were made. And they are hot, 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 hot. You get the Siegfried Idyll, which I've never really liked. I keep calling it the Siegfried Puddle, you know. I have to tell you my Siegfried Idyll story, actually. But wait a minute. We'll get to that. Siegfried Idyll, less than 18 minutes. Uh, forest Murmurs. <laughs> Goethe Dammerung, Siegfried Rhine Journey, and the Funeral March. Then you get the Richard Strauss Don Juan and and the love scene, the love scene from Feuer's No, or Fire Snot, as we call it in English. And so this is this is uh, this is the mo the mono one, and it's great. But the stereo one, oh, the stereo one is just as yummy. You get the 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 Tristan and Isolde uh, Liebes taught with Rita Gore, which is really. Oof, hot stuff. The Meister Singer Prelude, the Tannhäuser Prelude, you know, Overture, the, F the Flying Dutchman Overture, Lohengrin Preludes to Acts 1 and 3, and the Lohen and Ortrude's Aria with Rita Gore again, and Ent Vapte Götter, yeah, whatever it is, you know, Entweibte, what's the word here? I can't see. Entweibte Götter, yes, whatever. It's, it's Ortrude. Now, see, the trouble with Ortrude, the trouble with Ortrude, can we talk, folks? The trouble with Ortrude is that she's actually the smartest person in the opera. 
And Lohengrin is not an opera where the intelligence bar is raised very high. But the thing about Ortrud and what made me crazy when I first saw Lohengrin is that she wins. She's got it all set. I mean, Elsa's going to drop dead. Lohengrin is going to get on his schwein or swan or whatever and fly down the river and disappear. You know, everything is exactly the way she wanted. She's going to wind up ruling Brabant, except that all she has to do, all she has to do is shut up. But because this is an opera, she can't shut up. She has to sing. So, so Elsa's sitting there getting ready to drop dead. Lohengrin's talking about how disappointed he is and he's ready to leave. And she comes swooping in and saying, Aha! I've triumphed! The Schwan is really Prince Godfried, or whatever the hell his name is. In time for, of course, Lohengrin to pray to God and undo the spell and the prince to be released from the curse and Ortrud to shriek and scream and carry on about, ah, curses, foiled, ah! and run off stage for whatever whatever she does next. All she had to do was keep quiet. And the stupidity of that scene, the illogic of it, I mean, I know it's romantic. It's not supposed to be logical. Good has to triumph over evil. No, it doesn't. I'm rooting for evil. All through Lohengrin, I want evil to win. And when evil doesn't win, I feel gypped. I wanted my money back. Anyway, okay. That's my feeling about Lohengrin. Now, let me tell you my Siegfried Idyll story. I, I, I find the Siegfried Idyll to be one of the duller pieces of music in the history of Wagnerian whatever. I mean, it's very pretty. It's nice. It's sweet. It's good background music, you know, but it's, I, it's insipid as far as I'm concerned. It really is. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know, you know, they have, what's her name? Cosima. Remember Cosima? Cosima Wagner? Cosima von Liszt von Bulow Wagner? You know, she looked just like her dad, by the way, didn't she? Ugh. But anyway, she wrote in her diary about, you know, the premiere. You may remember the premiere was written for Cosima's birthday, and Wagner secretly rehearsed everybody so that she wouldn't know what was going on. And she wrote this diary, which was the most, you know, I mean, she lied about everything, you know. And, and she's like, oh, this morning I awoke to the most beautiful music. It was, it was just... Richard had given me the most amazing gift of my entire life. It was just a rapturous, beautiful thing, you know. And she does the whole thing. But I know what really happened at the premiere. This is what really happened at the premiere because I had a vision. I had a dream and I saw the true premiere of the Siegfried Idol. You had Wagner rehearsing all the musicians, you know, and Kozova was in a really bad mood. She was in a terrible mood because her birthday was coming up and nobody was around and Wagner was busy with some mysterious thing and she thought she was being ignored and she couldn't stand not to be the center of attention. She was just like Richard, you know? I mean, the two of them were made for each other. And so, and so what happened was she was sleeping in her boudoir and, and He's starting conducting, you know, the Siegfried Idyll on the stairway leading up to her boudoir in their villa at Triebschen, wherever the hell it was. And she gets up and she puts on this, this, this tattered, disgusting terry cloth bathrobe, you know, that she wears when she's in her morning room, you know, and she had a mud pack on her face, you know, curlers in her hair, you know, the whole deal. And she gets up and she screams at them from the top of the balcony. Will you stop that awful racket? You would think that on my birthday of all days, I could sleep late and have a little peace and a little bit of quiet and a little bit of comfort. But no, you and your damn musical friends, you had to go and ruin it for me. And Wagner stood in there going, Oh, but Liebchen, Liebchen, I wrote this for you. And she's going, Screw you, get the hell out of here, I'm going back to bed. Stomp, stomp, slam the door, and bang. And that was the premiere of the Siegfried Idyll. Then, of course, she sat down at her diary and said, Oh, I got the most wonderful gift from Ricard. Yeah, right. Ha ha. So there you go. The truth from me. You heard it here first. Next fabulous Wagner disc, and this may surprise you, Yuri Simonoff. I think these were reissued on, on um, Alto or one of those 
sort of reissue type label things. This was Collins Classic, Yuri Simonoff with the Philharmonia. This is one of those discs. It's just hot. It's terrific. It's a, also a great collection. You get the Prelude to Parsifal, uh, four excerpts from The Ring, The Ride of the Valkyries, Forest Murmurs. Oh, God, why? Siegfried Drawing Journey, the funeral, funeral music note, the funeral music, and the Prelude and Liebes taught from Tristan and Isolde, 18 minutes. It's just, it was stunningly recorded, technically fabulous. It's a magnificent, magnificent disc. Yuri Simonoff, go figure. However, there are two, two more to go, folks. Hang in there, we're getting there. This has to be one of my longest videos because we're talking about Wagner, right? So I can go as long as I damn well please. And you just have to sit there and take it. Well, see, no, you don't. You can turn it off, unlike Wagner, when you're sitting there trapped in a theater and they're droning on and on and on. Anyway, Klemps, Senior Klemperer. Oh, what a great Wagner conductor. Oh, he was so great in this music. Why? Because it has, you know, the woodwind section well forward and and he's completely unsentimental about it. I mean, he gets through the Siegfried Idol. Wait a minute, it's here. This is my favorite ever recording of the Siegfried Idol. It's 17 minutes and I think 51 seconds here, 31 seconds. It's exactly what it should be. It's, it's just wonderful. Actually, almost identical to Bruno Walter. It's kind of fascinating, you know? But uh, well, Walter was a little bit over 18. I don't know, they're all similar. Here we go. Rienzi, Overture, Tannhäuser, Overture, Tannhäuser, Prelude to Act 3, the Lohengrin Preludes to Acts 1 and 3, the Meistersinger Prelude, the Dance of the Adorable Little Apprentices, and Entry of the Masters from Meistersinger, the Parsifal Prelude to Act, Act what? Act 1, yeah, sure, Act 1. Then you get the Flying Dutchman Overture, the Entry of the Gods into Valhalla from Rheingold, The Ride of the Valkyries, the Siegfried Idol, Forest Murmurs, uh -huh. uh, Siegfried's Rhine Journey, Siegfried's Funeral March, it says here, and the Prelude Liebes taught to Tristan and Isolde, which is only 15 minutes long because it's Klemperer. And the thing about Klemperer is that although he had the reputation as a slow guy, he wasn't slow in slow music. He tended to be quick in slow music because he was completely unsentimental about it. Never mooned about, never had any of that. You know, and remember, Klemper made the all-time greatest recording of the Flying Dutchman. I mean, hands down, the greatest recording of the Flying Dutchman. He was a phenomenal Wagner conductor. And this two-disc set on EMI slash Warner or whatever it is, or wherever you get it, is an essential. It is a cornerstone in any Wagner collection. However, However, the other, however, is my all-time favorite Wagner disc for all of the wrong reasons. This one, Leopold Stokowski. Now, Stokowski conducted tons and tons and tons of Wagner, and he made lots of Wagner transcriptions, and he made his own arrangements. But whether or not it was his own arrangement or not, it was always his own arrangement because he always reorchestrated everything when he came to Wagner. He had no shame when it came to Wagner, and nowhere does he have less shame than on this disc, this Everest disc. You get Parsifal, the Good Friday spell, and his Act Three symphonic synthesis which is absolutely wonderful. And then you get, well, actually it starts with Wotan's Farewell and the Magic Fire music. And this, this, oh my God, you have to hear this. First of all, he adds an organ somewhere when the fire happens. There's an organ, I swear. I don't know why or how he did it, but there's an organ. Second of all, he uses what sounds like 175 harps, not the six that Wagner actually wrote for. I, you've never in your life heard more harps. It is miked in the weirdest possible way. It's so odd. And second of all, all of the woodwind parts that Wagner wrote, he basically, I think, rewrites for the strings. You know, the end of Valkyrie is a beautiful chord for, you know, the, the wind ensemble. No, it's not. It's for the strings. It's for just the violins and the harps with unbelievable quantities of vibrato attached. If you only have one Stokowski recording, one Wagner recording of bleeding chunks, you have to hear this. This is, this is, 
you're either going to be horrified and disgusted, which I, I understand, or you're just going to fall in love, as I did, and as I suspect you will. So that, my friends, is my summary of Wagner bleeding chunks that you really have to hear. I'm sure you probably have some of these. Some of them may have come as a surprise. I don't know. But gosh, golly, even with Wagner, we can keep on listening and have a good time doing it. So thank you all. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy.